Numerous African countries will be heading to the polls this year, among them Senegal, Nigeria, South Africa, and later on in the year, Botswana. So how does that change their risk premium? We did an election roundup uh, discussion with Ronek Gopaldis, the director of Signal Risk. We start with the big daddy in the western part of Africa, and that's Nigeria going for elections. The presidential elections, that is, on the 16th of February, current president Muhammadu Buhari. But will it remain that way? Ronek, what's at stake when you look at Nigeria's presidential elections? So usually the case in Nigeria, high stakes affairs, very much a zero sum kind of political dynamic. This time around, slightly different though, because uh, this time around you've got both candidates, or both leading candidates who are northern Muslims. So some of the kind of north-south Christian Muslim uh, ethnic and religious factors which are usually prevalent mm -hmm. around the presidential election are no longer there. Uh, and in addition, in 2015, we saw a precedent of power from a ruling party being handed over to an opposition. So, you know, that's, that set uh, another interesting uh, precedent. But the big issues are obviously the economy, security, corruption, uh, and it's going to be a very competitive race um, because on the one hand, you've got uh, a president, the incumbent, who uh -huh. is seen to be strong in corruption, but uh, economically a little bit aloof. Uh -huh. And on the other hand, you've got a guy who's promising heaven and earth, a reformer who's seen to be uh, a bit weak on corruption. So how do you invest this read what's going on in, Ni in Nigeria? Who is the better of the two candidates for business? So that's going to be interesting because the investment community is quite split uh, okay. in Nigeria. So on the one hand, you know, given what they saw last time with the disruption, with the policy inertia associated with the transition, they don't want to take that risk. On the other hand, the, Im the status quo is so imperfect that they, they want to hang their hat on reform. And uh, Atiku Abu Bakr is promising, you know, floating the Naira, changing the central bank governor, uh, a wave of reforms which, uh, which will encourage uh, business and investment. So it remains to be seen, uh, you know, what the business community actually wants. But I think uh, what's also very interesting in Nigeria is mm -hmm. going to be the turnout on the day, the regional voting dynamics and the electoral maths, because that's going to to determine who's going to win the election. Essentially, you have the two biggest uh, political groups, then that is the APC and the PDP. Some say, what are the chances of uh, a coalition, especially with the emergence of Kinsley Magulu? Some say he might win the youth vote and be able to put any of these parties into power. Do you see the youth vote as a factor? So the youth vote is going to be interesting because both the candidates are above the age of 70. So you've got you know, this classic tension between a young population uh, being governed by effectively their grandfathers, if you look at Atiku and Buhari. Now there's that Facebook facelift generation tension. Um, so yes, the youth vote, there could be a bit of apathy, it could be split, but it's difficult to see this, this presidential election being won by, by anyone either than uh, President Buhari or Atiku Abu Bakr. What do you tell investors when you look at Nigeria? What are your, t what are your three top risks? Three top risks. I mean, the economy is is obviously uh, front and center. It's mm -hmm. it's biggest economy in Africa, huge potential. But what we need is policy consistency and credibility. Um, so what investors don't want is a prolonged period of inertia. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know this election needs to be done and dusted very quickly. Uh, Wildcard factors are a big risk. You know what happens to the health of the president if there's a security attack and there's a postponement. What does that mean? if there's no conclusive result and there has to be a runoff, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to create a lot of anxiety amongst uh, investors. So, but the, the big elephant in the room, mm -hmm. whenever you talk about Nigeria, is the price of oil. Uh, and that is kind of central to the economic fortunes mm -hmm. of the country. All right, we move along to the second country that will most noticeably be looked at when we head for elections, and that is Senegal. It will be heading for the elections on the 24th of February 2019. Current President Marki Sall, with a total population of just over 15 million people. Do you really expect um, uh, Senegal to be also another wild card when you look at the presidential layout? Largely, I mean, people don't see a strong challenger for Marquis Sall. A lot of that is by design. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the electoral laws have changed quite significantly in, in Senegal over the years. The last presidential election was in 2012, uh, and that uh, catered for a seven-year term. The electoral law has now been changed, and going forward, the Senegalese president will have a five-year term. In addition to that, two of the leading opposition candidates have been uh, disqualified or ruled 
to be ineligible because of uh, changes in the electoral law. That's Khalifa Sal mm -hmm. and Karim Wade, uh, and those were major challenges. Um, so that's that's one aspect. And then there's the sponsorship bill, which has also made it even more difficult for um, for political challenges in, in the presidential race by creating more onerous barriers to entry. Now, the criticism mm -hmm. of Macky Sall and his government is that they're using legal means to uh, adopt more authoritarian behavior and to reduce the political competitiveness. And investors don't like that. Investors yes. don't like an authoritarian man in charge at all. But investors also do like stability. So it's a catch-22 uh, because, you know, the... the economy in Senegal is, is kind of ticking along quite nicely. Um, the electoral outcome, it looks very difficult uh, to see a situation where Macky Sall doesn't win, particularly because of the convincing victory in the parliamentary elections last year uh, by his, his ruling coalition. But, you know, there, there, there's this disgruntlement in, in Senegal around the water shortages in Dakar, the youth issues, um, which are... Which are uh, playing into mm -hmm. uh, some of the discontent and as well as this rising authoritarian uh, streak that we're, we're seeing. Parting question, are you worried about the possible Islamic or extremist uh, uh, militancy that we've seen from the neighboring countries around Senegal filtering into Senegal? So these are always concerns, particularly mm -hmm. because they rely on the element of surprise and shock. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the risk of a, a major attack is something in every election that you can't discount. So, you know, the region has, has got a lot of issues, um, but I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not our core scenario. It, it would be a wild card. All right, let's move over to the tip that tops, and that's South Africa. It's due for elections sometime around May this year. We're still awaiting the president to confirm their date. A population of just over 56 million people with a GDP of about $349 billion. That's according to the World Bank's last estimate in 2017. South Africa, it seems to be at risk of the left within the African National Congress, if you will, represented by Zuma loyalists who want, uh, uh, who have a different view when it comes to the Reserve Bank, for instance, to the right, which is represented by Ramaphosa, and maybe that's a more left-center position, if you will. Who do you think is winning the policy argument, and what does that mean for South Africa's economic development? So there's a lot of hysteria and a lot of confusion and a lot of emotion when mm -hmm. you're talking about South Africa, the political economy situation. So, you know, when the first part of last year we had Ramaphoria, uh, stock markets rallied, the RAND rallied, uh, positive feel-good factor, the new dawn, uh, lots of personnel changes and the likes. Then the land debate emerged and then we had this Ramageddon kind of scenario. <laughs> uh, and, now, like this. and now people are, are adopting a bit more of a sober view to yeah. say that actually um, there's nuance in this. And the big disconnect with the South African uh, political economy is that on the one hand, investors are enthused by political progress mm -hmm. where they're seeing signs of reform, uh, state-owned enterprises are being, are being cleaned up, um, personnel and key economic clusters are, uh, or previously incompetent people are being replaced with more mm -hmm. competent people. But then the economy is, is bound by structural rigidities and there's policy confusion. And like the ANC mentioned. hasn't been, the ANC-led government hasn't been able to grow this economy in, what, the better part of the last nine years? We've been in stagnation for a while. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to carry weight with the voters come May? So, I mean, you have to look at the, the overall landscape, right? So we're very much in a holding pattern, but President Ramaphosa is very popular. Now, can he uh, bring people who previously were disillusioned with ANC on board? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the promise of the new dawn, uh, age of renewal, uh, that remains to be seen. But then you look at the alternatives, the DA are scoring own goals uh, at an alarming rate, be it through the Western Cape uh, situation with Patricia DeLille, be it through the water crisis, mm -hmm. the head of policy has just resigned now. So, you know, there seems to be a lack of coherence in that party. The EFF are, of course, very good at sound bites, um, but, you know, and the theatrics of it all. But, uh, you know, some of their trump cards have gone. Zuma's gone, uh, education, land, these are policy positions that are being co-opted by the ANC. So, you know, are people going to come out uh, and, and vote? Uh, is social media an accurate gauge of, of uh, electoral turnout? Ipsos polls are indicating otherwise. Uh -huh. So, you know, I think the, the election is obviously going to be competitive, but, uh, you know, Ramaphosa's ANC, if they can get the ideological coherence yeah. intact, I think... Um, 
we'll see we'll see them get close to 60 percent of the vote okay now moving on to the neighbor to south africa and that is botswana one of the most stable democracies on the continent but it hasn't always been this boring recently we've had a little bit of excitement coming from that country the current president of the country of course is mokwezi masisi and they last went to the elections in 20 14 and this will be a big one i think for botswana considering that botswana democratic party has been in charge since 1966 do you expect any real change especially when you put what has been happening within the political party some say there are two factions in that party a faction loyal to the former president ian kama and a faction loyal to the current president but we're seeing proxy war play yeah. themselves out there what does that mean for the bdp so yeah, it's, the the situation is very fluid uh, mm -hmm. in Botswana in in the the political domain. Um, you know, the succession of Ian Kama was meant to be a smooth process. Um, you know, status quo being maintained, but there's been a very public fallout between uh, uh, Ian Kama and his and his successor. Um, so much so that they've asked Vestas Mokhai, the former president, to mediate. Mm -hmm. Now there's clear factionalism. Uh, the BDP has been losing. Uh, an electoral share at the polls. And lest we forget, there's a little matter of the party's presidential uh, race happening before the elections. And that pits a former minister who was fired by the current president. Do you see, do you see Billy Nomi coming to the fore and possibly changing Masisi's uh, reign as the president of Botswana Democratic Party? Look, what happens at the party congress uh -huh. uh, depends whether they're going to be able to, to resolve their issues because if it carries on on the current trajectory, uh, there's a very, very real risk that uh, come the elections in October, they lose a majority, which uh, is in nobody's interest. So I, I wouldn't bet against Masisi at this point, but the factional battles need to be resolved. Um, and how that plays out is going to be interesting. So we've Final. seen a directional shift mm -hmm. uh, in the BDP under Masisi, you know, in terms of the engagement with the press, in terms of the engagement with the trade unions, mm -hmm. more reform oriented approach. Uh, but this public spat is uh, it threatens to, to rip up the party at the seams. But while Masisi, of course, governs, his enemies are blessed with time and the devil makes uh, work for idle hands, doesn't he? Uh, let's talk about the economic risks here. I mean, you look at Botswana's uh, consistent GDP growth, always uh, within the mid to higher uh, range, if you will. My question here is that we saw a uh, mining decline in the third quarter of 2019, and Botswana is very much a resource-based economy. Does that pose a threat, especially when you look at that vis-a-vis -vis the rising youth unemployment? Yeah, of course. Uh, fiscal consolidation as well. So, you know, with this political inertia, this factional battles, preoccupation with internal issues, the stuff that needs to happen with the country's economy um, is, is being put on the back burner. So Moody's came out recently with a statement saying that they're expecting um, delays in, in this consolidation. The arrangement with De Beers is, is set for renegotiation in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, so is this political situation going to, going to affect that? Mm -hmm. That's another, another issue. Uh, and then diversification of the economy is a consistent issue. Uh, they're also uh, prone to, to changes in the weather. Uh, and, and climate change and, and these kind of things, which uh, with, with drought and the likes uh, are going to, to, to play a pivotal role in the region. Mm. That's Ronan Gopaldas, director at Signal Risk. We thank him for his time and for being a friend of the show. We're back on your screen on Thursday at 6.30, only on CNBC. Until then, keep it locked.